Welcome to day two of the DEF CON. Uh, unfortunately, the hotel was unaware it was two days, uh, but we got that fixed. Uh, thanks to all of you who helped fix it. And uh, as you can see, we have the entire room today, which we weren't supposed to have, and we're not paying for it. Uh, but uh, it's nicer to have a bigger room, a little more light. Uh, and we have additional water back there. I wanted to point out the water service free of charge, of course. Uh, so, uh, Anyway, you don't have to pay for a bottle of water if you don't want it. Um, so uh, I think uh, so far breakfast has been decent. Um, we've been having some interesting meals out for those of us who've done it. And uh, welcome to Tony Wyatt, who arrived yesterday from Australia. Uh, great to see you here. And, uh, I know, uh, you know, most uh, we have meals. Welcome. Did I say it right? Yeah. Oh, wow. Here he goes. Uh, <laughs> from Denmark. I uh, and uh, Steve Sully from uh, Canada. And Paul, what's his name? Uh, you know, <laughs> Paul. That's all, that's all he needs. Because he's so good. Paul uh, from Virginia. L.D. Okay. Stevens from uh, New Jersey. Connecticut. Connecticut. Okay. Connecticut. That's right. <coughs> uh, and Mark Ritter from Iowa. Uh, and uh, I think all the rest of uh, oh, Glenn Hanklad back there from Canada, uh, and all the rest of us are from, from Sacramento, and Jerry Gray, and Bill Clay, and Michael Salcedo with the Cubs, and Brian Carpignano and Sue Carpignano, and Grace, and Grace. Hey, Grace. Uh, so, uh, looking on, future development. So, <laughs> well, welcome to one and all, and it's uh, great to see you guys. So far, Andy West has been going uh, somewhat smoothly until this morning. So, uh, but uh, just uh, enjoy. And if you have any questions or any problems, uh, let me know. I don't know what I'll do about it, but let me know. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm going to tell you about our graphics.library interface with the device drivers, how device driver is structured, and how it is interfaced. Firstly, let's look at how the Amiga OS works with graphics drivers. There are several OS components involved. We have PCI graphics over in the top right hand corner. We've got two the image, top left hand corner. We've got graphics the library more or less in the middle. The device driver over on the right in the middle and load monitor drivers. Side. All of these components except load long drives are all loaded like start and run independently of each other. I mean they're started independently of each other. Here's PCI graphics. It's uh, well part of it anyway. It's a fairly simple program. Started by Kickstart, as I said. It has a table of known PCI cards. I get a huge table of um, 350 odd entries. Um, yeah, so every PCI card that's ever been supported. All the Radeon cards, you know, Voodoo, um, etc. And it has an internal list there. And when PCI graphics runs, it searches the PCI bus out on the right hand side and builds up a list of cards that it finds. It does that by searching the PCI bus for graphics cards known from the table and adding those files to a private list. A card that is not already in the table of known cards will not be recognized or added to the private list. The list of nodes contain the cards vendor and device IDs, name string, the name of the required driver, and so on. If you want to support a new graphics card, you must add its details to the table of known cards. The private list is arranged so that the default card is at the top of the list. 
others holding in lower positions. So-called active cards, and please don't ask me what that means because I don't fully understand it. But you have active cards and inactive cards, and I think it refers back to the state of ceremony. In the classic days, whether it had been emitted by the um, auto uh, unit hardware. Okay. But don't quote me on that, maybe not. So called active cards are added to the top of the list, while inactive cards are added to the other end. PCI graphics does no more than create the list, and they're labeled and called by graphics on the left hand side here. It reports um, the, um, the uh, end card from the list as graphic interrogates it. Now, until recently, PCI graphics has been unable to scan for or detect any cards that are not PCI based that have an entry in the table. There, there is, or well, there was, an entry in the PCI cards for the um, graphics. Chip that was in the sample for the radio. No, no, they are. Of course, and there's the, another entry for the, uh, for the silicon That's motion of IO2 that's in the sample 60. But they were both connected to the PCI bus yeah. anyway, so they just fell really into place. I have modified PCI graphics to test for and add a node for the P1022 GIU. Uh, display interface well, in so when running on a table and the the uh, table device is actually resident so it has to be started from the start before PCI graphics will find it. This is a hack which should be made more general uh, allowing for another table of non-PCI devices because in the future of course all processes are going to be designed with so this is very roughly how graphics starts up. How the device parts would start up anyway. Graphics stop library of course does much more than have the device drivers, but uh, a little bit of discussion to the initialization of the device drivers. So, the library's first visible function is to display the splash screen, the so-called boot image. Which is the last thing in this sequence here. That's start up when uh, Kickstart starts everything going. It runs PCI graphics. PCI graphics makes up the list of available boards. Graphics starts up and one of its first jobs is to uh, is to create the initial boot screen for boot image. So it creates view over the monitors, get display in the road. Eventually this decides that hey there must be a monitor out there, what can it do? And part of the graphic driver has either functions for or a path straight through to the monitor down to the sticks there. Uh, via its high squared C interface to get the DDC information on the monitor. And in the case of the B1022, which does not have, sorry, B, the table, I should say. In the case of the table, which does not have a specific I squared C interface on the board for the monitor, because all the I squared C interfaces were used up for other things. Uh, it uses GPIO bits, which you have to toggle in software to talk to the monitor. Tony, yep. this uh, EIU, is that a separate hardware chip? Or no, 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 no. It's on the P1022. It? Oh, it's built in? Yeah. It's in the CPU. Yeah. 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 And so, you, why do you need GPIO to talk to it? <laughs> talk to the monitor. Yeah. And, and the GPIO is only needed to 
make up an ice cream seed in the place. Oh, yeah. it's a fakey. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we don't have an ice cream seed chip on there. Oh, you know there's an ice cream seed chip there with 16 channels, but they're all used. Oh. There, there wasn't one spare for the monitor. It wasn't. So, oh. so they wired the two bits of the monitor into it, the GPI, yeah. one of the GPI registers. Oh, okay. yeah. Do you have and that's we've wired into the, 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 the monitor line to go yep. interrogate the monitor. Yep. Yep. So you have to write a, a GPIO ice cream seed? I found one. Well, yeah. It's good to see. Yeah. Right left from scratch. <laughs> it's Tony. He builds his own trains of engines. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> we that, right? <laughs> Finally, anyway, graphics starts and runs the boot image task. Yeah. This is a separate task, <coughs> which we'll look at next. There's Blah, 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 yeah, 
They saw all this before, and in fact, it's duplicated. It, the boot image does the same thing to, to uh, show you splash screen, and then when you're creating the workbench picture, it does the whole thing again. It's a little bit wasteful, but it, the system's doing other things at the time that you need to look at. So, it's first of all the, the default monitor. Get the information by calling get. Get the information from by calling get board data tags, which returns the name of the first of all board. Load long drives then calls in its board tags to start up the board device drive. And that, as I said, reads the image and return. This is the device driver down here in this box. This is the graphics box here. Load mod drive and start the workbench screen by calling create display info data, which is a part of graphics. And that just goes into the, into the device driver through its vector function table. And this does all the work of creating your workbench screen and so on. A device driver block diagram. This is structured with a, a card level and a chip level. A, a card level is uh, is the outer box, and the, you you may have one or more chips inside it. Um, a lot of device drivers and simple ones only have one chip per card, so uh, it's. It's so simple that way. So you've got the card level that finds the interface to the PCI bus, register addresses, that sort of thing. It must also support any hardware that's common for the chips, such as uh, I2C interface to its monitor or monitor. And then you've got the chip level, which defines the behaviour of the innermost workings of the device. There could be more than one chip per card in the general case. Chip level must support all the initialization of each chip and the dynamic programming of each chip. Then you've got all your callers coming in, uh, a function table for all your vectors. There are 69 different uh, function uh, vectors. You counted them? You counted them all? I counted them. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll show you where those are in a bit. Yeah. You'll use ten. See, each device driver, each display is defined and handled by a board info structure. When the system starts up, when the when boot image is displaying the splash screen, when the graphics limb is defined, it is displaying the workbench picture, the graphics driver is handed a board info structure. And this board info structure we'll have to look at in a minute. But you get one for each display. So for instance, if you if you the driver, if you have a Picture in picture display or a uh, an overlay display for a uh, movie program or something like that. You will have one board info structure for each of the each of the areas that you're displaying in your, on your screen. Uh, here are all the vector functions, of course. As I said, there are 69 of those. Oh yeah, the board info structure is created by graphics the library. So the device driver doesn't have any say in it. The uh, board info says this, uh, uh, this display is 1280 by 768 or whatever. 
and its mode is is a 32 bit RGB or whatever. And the device driver has no say in that whatsoever. It, it, it can either display that mode and that board info or it can't. It can't even say to graphics, hey, I can't do this. Okay, as an example, the card level of the table DIU supports the, the hardware interrupt and the onboard chip that oh yeah, right. But the onboard chip that interfaces the 3.3 volt outputs of the uh, of the DIU to the 5 volt outputs of the of the monitor. That, in, that interface chip um, is accessed by one of the channels on the onboard ISPFC bus, which is all right confusing, so it won't go to that. <laughs> Here's part of your board infrastructure. It's in three sections. Uh, the first section has some 33 fields defined. It do have stuff like your register addresses and so on. <clears throat> and Etc. And the last one of those is a pixel clock. Then you've got all your vectors. And yes, these are resident within the board infrastructure. You'd think they'd be resident somewhere else with a pointer from the board infrastructure. No. There are 69 of those. And then after them, you've got another 53 <coughs> fields, which we'll have as later, obviously. Yes. So it's, it's completely unexpandable. Expandable. Hmm? It's expandable. It, yeah. yeah, I've expanded. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, where, where are these? Where are the? Where is the structure actually defined? Is where is it? It's where is it defined? Is this? It's it, you can't. You can't see it. It's you mean? Term. Well, you mean the source? No, no, no. No, the, I mean specifically. The, if I was going to write, I mean the definition of the input structure. Yeah. If I was going to write a driver. Yeah. Would I be using this because this is necessary, or this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So where is this? Fine. Where is the where is the documentation? It's in the Picasso ninety six source code. Yeah. You don't get oh, that. so there's no, actually there is no documentation on this. No, no, no. Go public. Okay. So the code is just to answer all the event. Uh, so the idea was that this would be made public at some point. Yeah. And uh, it's never quite happened. It's never happened. You know? So if you want to write a graphics driver, you have to be on the your board dev team, team. you got to be on the list. You have to be on the list. Yeah, you have to be on the list. You're not on the list. I've never been on the list. Well, not that list. And uh, if, but but there's been rumblings recently that Hyperion would release uh, an SDK for making graphics drivers by third parties. Mm -hmm. But I haven't seen anything come up again. So uh, just to let everybody know. That's not going to conflict with Jens's ownership of Picasso 96. No, the Hyperion have a contract with Yens, okay. so it's covered. Okay. okay, here are a few of the vector uh, functions. Allocate memory, free memory, blah, blah, blah. Set switch, which means um, this is a classic uh, throwback in the days when you could turn your, your video on and off on a, a plug-in board and either use the built-in uh, video from the from the classic, or you use the video from the plug-in graphics card. So you turn it on and off. Set the, the uh, contents of the color array, the color lookup table. Set this, set that. Blah 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 blah. It just goes on and on and on. And now, as I said, some seventy odd um, vector primitives there. So, <coughs> you don't have to implement all these at once. There's a document in the Picasso 96 um, source called Card Develop Doc, Doc that describes all these, but it's really aimed at the assembly language programmer of Pascal. So, it's a fairly old document. The document can be found in blah, 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 string here, which is Run across the page if anyone wants to. Was that public? No, it's in the Picasso 96 sources. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> in time, I'll produce a skeleton graphics device driver that the computer can use when it doesn't get new devices. Okay, PCI cards. This is a part of the table which I mentioned for used by PCI graphics. There are 520 cards. Sorry, I remember this chapter number. So you've got your Cirrus, your Radeon, hundreds of Radeons, literally. Your Perm Media, Silica Motion, that's the one on the Sam 460. Yeah, this is the new one in the V1022 CPU, which I've added. <coughs> and the null to complete the table. So it's easy to add a new one, as you can see. What you've got to do is put in the name of the driver, its addresses, a few tags, a few tags, and so on. Yeah, question for me, Tom. Why is yours a card and there's a chip? A chip and a card. In the aforementioned documentation, yeah. it uh, makes the point that the card is the overall uh, describing the hardware, and the chip is what goes on top of the card. It says that if you have a simple device, you can make the chip and the card uh, interchangeable. Uh -huh. And so you, uh, so you only need the, uh, either the card or the chip structure. But if, of course, you have several chips on the one card, which some of the answer stuff might have. Um, uh -huh. Interesting. Then you'll need a card and put one or more chips set to go with it. If you're adding one of these items, you can use examples of previous device drivers. There are plenty of classic and PCI based drivers in the source repository. Just be sure not to use any code that might be subject to dispute over its ownership. Certainly having had to rewrite something. Okay, now onto the, the uh, more interesting part. This is how the device Interface unit, uh, display interface unit, sorry, works in the table of CPU. <coughs> it supports three planes, three video planes. In Mega Speed, we call them layers. And they have obviously layer one, two, and three. Now, this is an example that I've taken straight out of the, the uh, Freescale documentation. The these can overlay the others with transparency or chroma key, although the order of the layers is fixed one, two, three. Three is always on the top. There's also a hardware cursor, 32 by 32 pixels. The DIU can display one, two, or three layers simultaneously. You can also write back to memory the result of the display. So you can generate a composite display like that and then write that back to the memory somewhere. Since this is all done by DMA in real time during the scan, every scan, uh, you don't want to do too much or you're going to slow down the whole chain. It, it, it's a simple list. The DIU contains a lookup table for, for gamma correction with 256 values for each of red, green, and blue. There's also a built-in table of values for color lookup table display mode. Since the DIU DMA is data from memory in real time, it has a limited bandwidth. With a single layer operating, the DIU can display 1280 by 1024, according to the documentation. Although I have not yet found a set of timing data to make that work. The best I can get is 1280 by 800. According to the documentation, if all layers are being fetched and displayed at once, the limit is 1280 by 768. Right. Here are your GIE registers. These are the hardware registers in the DIU. And there are not many of them. You've got three uh, so-called area descriptors, one for each of the three planes. 
what we saw at the points and so on. The area descriptor for each plane is the thing which does most of the work. This is rather like the card level, uh, the chip level, that you come up with. Here are the area descriptors, the one that does most of the work. But there's not much of it. This is the complete structure. So <coughs> you've got a pixel format, which is whether it's um, RGB8 or RGB, uh, R5, G6B5, whatever. All of those, uh -huh. Uh -huh. a lot of those um, known and loved pixel formats are supported. Uh, the bitmap address from where the, the device has to DMA its data. Uh, another packed field uh, giving you source size and so many pixels by so many pixels, etc. etc. Um, nothing else there very interesting. And the next AD. So on a, a particular uh, layer, you can have several of these area descriptors. You can display a box up here and another box down there, and a third box down there. And it, this box is chained from the next AD to that box, which is chained to that box. So it can only fetch and display that area, that area, and that area. So boxes must not overlap. Together. I can't remember why you want to do that rather than just pick one, one area with, uh, with an alpha value of zero. Is that just for picture in pictures? No. There has to be a rectangle box. It can be a polygon shape with that one oh, mimicking, somehow faking, overlapping windows. No, where it's, where it's the size. Yeah, yeah, it has to be a box. Yeah. They can't overlap. It'd be a hell of a display uh, you're describing if it, if it wasn't up next. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested to see how that works. Well, no. And just calculating it all and just making it a big deal. I'm just the light of the players will have to change. Now, one thing I just want to point out is that the, of the available tool formats, the, the, the only formats that can display are those which, in which a particular number of pixels at a time, say three, four pixels at a time. Uh, sorry, bytes at a time display a single pixel. You can't do formats like YUV422 where you have one group of bytes um, followed by the other group of bytes. And between them, they display two pixels. It can't support that. Okay, here's a Here's a driver like the one for the table with the <coughs> with no available I squared C interface channel and a GPI wrote it for transcept and drop it. It may help someone in the future if I describe my experience with this device. Right, here is here from the table user manual documentation are uh, the two bits of GPI, uh, the serial clock and the serial data, which are connected out to the DVI port. According to this, they are GPI 2, they are bidirectional. That's wrong. Uh, they are, in fact, wired up to GPIO 3. The data is bidirectional and the clock is right only. Uh, where did this come from? Was this from Verisys or was this from the uh, NXP people? This information. Where did it come from? The, the information is, is a screen grab from the table uh, user manual. Okay, so it came from Verisys? Yes. I'll be more like, oh, look at it, just something 
It's for the clock and the right. The R squared C bus is point to point. Of course, one end is the master and the other is the slave. The I squared C bus protocol requires that the bus master listen to the bus in case the slave interrupts a transfer to abort it. But that can't be done in this case. The reason is this. Each bit in the GPIO is programmed to be either an input or an output. And if an output, either a totem pole or a moment drain driver. The bit used for the clock, this one here, is not bidirectional as it's said. It's output only. So you, you can never, from the processor side, read what's on the incoming clock line if there is anything incoming from the remote device. How long did it take to figure this out? Yeah. A while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had to buy myself a new scope. Yeah, you didn't believe your scope. <laughs> Follows also that if you want to if you want to clear the serial data bit during your toggling, if you read the register, clear the serial data bit, and then write it back again, you clear this step thing as well. You didn't want it, but you have because it reads as zero all the time. Trap for young players. In practice, you have to write down and remember the last value that you that you wrote the clock in, and use that when you're when you are referring to the contents of the register, ignoring what you read. This practice is inconsistent with the full I squared C protocol, but as long as the monitor on the end of the cable doesn't try to abort a transfer, which it would do like in the clock line uh, in the middle of a transaction. Uh, as long as it doesn't try to do that, it's going to work. It might not always work in the future. You can see the code for these tricks in the E1022 GIU, GIU code for DDC.C. Functions to read and write to the monitor are <coughs> uh, uh, in the graphics driver, but the vectors for those functions are written into the mode info, board info structure, so the graphics can call the vision directly to the the model. Okay, future work. Currently I'm working on implementing overlay support. I don't yet know whether that will speed up movie display or not, but we'll find out eventually. So I want to build a table or board into a laptop case with a dedicated display. Once the audio support is finished, where is it? We should be able to run standalone without any plugin in Well, that's it. I can give you references to any of the documents if you wish to see them. How much, how much more resolution do you think you could get out of that? You said you got 1200 by 800? Or? No, I've got 1280 by 800. It says 1280 by 1024, but as I said, I actually don't forget that. Which I think should be adequate for a laptop. Yeah. It's a little one. So that, that area description stuff? The area description? Like you, you said, uh, so I could have, say, plane two, and I could have chained areas within plane two? Yes. But they can't overlap. They can't overlap. You thinking that you could use that to come up with some sort of a picture picture overlay uh, mimic? No, I was really thinking of uh, using this to make the overlay. Oh, okay. That makes more sense. Because okay. then you could just make it a chroma and then use some sort of, and then you could have multiple images. Yeah, yeah. Picture picture in the old uh, <coughs> uh, graphics drivers, you could only have one picture picture overlay, and then the next one had to be just see as opposed to the, there was a picture, picture not overlay, I guess. On the old uh, radio well, product. I've, I've, I've never used it or seen it. So. Yeah, on well, like 440 or the XE and so on, you can only have one picture in picture. If you open up a second video, it wasn't going to use picture in picture, it was going to be CPU drawn. Oh, I see. 
in the new overlay, they have multiple windows. Or overlay video. Yeah. Composite. Yeah. Composite. Yeah. 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 Composite. Yeah. yeah. You know, we made up the name for it. Yeah. Right. I'm not sure that composite is the wrong word. It is. Yeah, 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 right. We have to pick something. <laughs> yeah, but so you do not those areas, you do the screen overlays and then you can do that. If you can move the area like that. Well, you don't have to move any. That's the whole point. It's all done by DMA, by the device. All you've got to do is tell the device where to find it. Well, I thought you said that if you're, if you know that it has to be accessed and changed and so on, it's those whole machine. Yeah. But that's yeah, at a very low hardware level. Right. It's not because you're doing a lot of work under program control. Okay. You're, you're getting to do a lot of work at the bus level with DMA. Right. One of the fields in the, in the registers here is this one here, priority lookup table. And you can um, set the priority of the various DMA streams so so that you don't slow down other things on the screen. It, can, it gives you recommended you know, numbers to write in here, which I haven't tried experimenting with. The recommended numbers are some weird bit pattern, and it gives you no information about what they what what the number happen is. <laughs> surprise. Yeah, surprise. <laughs> Any other questions? Would uh, Hans uh, book on Warp 3D programming the graphic card or graphics help on any of this stuff? Um, not at this level, Bill, because okay, yeah, that's what I thought. This is only a proprietary device right. driver. Yeah, Hans. Uh, yeah, it's good. Warp 3D is all a level or two about that. Yeah. Not that much. Uh, 
information. It's, it's not a lot. But traditionally, it's been secret because they wanted the option to change their minds. Who? Uh, the original authors in 90, 1996. Okay. And uh, time has moved on. Yeah. And I was uh, unable to get permission to publish it for whatever reason. Oh, okay. Right? So you guys have a, you have a license by the... Well, things have changed since Jens purchased P96. Uh-huh. seems to have made up a couple. Yeah, but the legal thing has changed, okay. right? Okay. So now it's not a license anymore. You, well, I don't know what it is. I don't know what contract they oh. came up with. And maybe they got ownership. Or Sorry, I didn't a fork. Or I didn't the derail this time. Right. So that uh, guys like Tony can come in there without access to everything right. and add a new graphics card. Right? That's what we want. Yeah. Yeah. You shouldn't have to have access to everything to do this. Thing. No. You should have access to a skeleton drawer, which would yeah. Be great. Now you, you're this. The unique thing about this, like you said, though, is it's not a PCI bus right. interface. Yeah. What's there is is based around PCI. Yeah, this one's based on DMA. Yeah, direct inside the chip. Yeah. Fortunately, you don't have to use the DMA channels in the in the uh, yeah, chip as well. Yeah, you, you don't use the engine. You use it has its own it's private. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. So to support more SOCs, uh, we have to come up with a, another API that doesn't cater to PCI in a way, right? Like, uh, so you can add another yeah. SOC. Or just the, the API that involves PCI to have different modes. Besides it's written PCI. in a variation of PCI graphics yeah. or non-PCI graphics. Yeah, if, if we want to go that route. Uh, I remember um, AQ, like you said at the beginning, decided to hook everything up with PCI to make it super easy. Yeah. So they just use PCI to bus everything. To connect everything instead of I squared C and P and A right? And then it just goes. <laughs> that was a conscious decision on their part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they, they took a different route. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Done. I guess so. Thank you. Thank you, Tim.